Hello. How's it going? <laughs> it's going great. I'm sitting down here. I'm in the Ielson building down in the core of the campus. You're up on Westridge in your office. Is your office in the Geophysical Institute? Is that correct? Uh, yeah, so it, it, I'm sitting actually in, in what's called the Westridge Research Building, so an annex to the Geophysical Institute, but I'm part of the GI, yes. And uh, Westridge, people on campus refer to that as the WERB. It has the WERB. The WERB. Exactly. <laughs> what's, so I know that the scientists, they share their expertise between many departments, institutes, colleges, schools. How does that work for you? When you tell someone where you work, how do you identify where you work from? Oh, that is very complicated. I actually have a quite uh, complex appointment, I would say. Uh, I mostly, I would say, identify myself as being part of the Geophysical Institute here at UAF, where we do, um, you know, exciting research on everything re that's, that relates to the Earth, everything from the ionosphere uh, to remote sensing uh, to permafrost research and so on. Um, I have a lot of collaboration with, within the GI, so most of the research projects I'm doing are in some way uh, collaborative with uh, people in the GI. I have a teaching appointment that also relates to CNSM, the College of Natural Sciences and Mathematics. And um, so I'm teaching there remote sensing for the geosciences department. And we also have collaborations in engineering. So it's pretty broad across campus. And that's pretty standard for a scientist. You, you, you're so focused on the work that you do and everyone's doing their own thing. They need to bring in the experts from all over to collaborate. That's such a big thing in uh, STEM fields is collaboration. Yeah, and especially um, you know, if you do remote sensing and you live in places like Alaska, you have, you know, if you want to really learn something across the entire state, which is hard to get out to, hard to do field work in, uh, you know, adding some remote sensing components is always important. So we are, as a team, uh, part of a, a lot of projects where we provide the remote sensing support. And your Twitter handle is SAR Evangelist. <laughs> SAR being an acronym for Synthetic Aperture Radar. Talk just a little bit. I know you could you can you can spin yarns about SAR for hours. Why are you a SAR evangelist? What do you like about synthetic aperture radar? Uh, so well, so I think uh, you know synthetic synthetic aperture radar has actually been around for quite some time. The first SAR was launched in the 1970s already uh, by NASA with the CSAT mission. But really, over the last maybe five years, uh, SAR has come along quite a bit. Uh, it sort of came out of its shell of sort of being a nice little science experiment to becoming something quite different to, to providing a lot of input and support for a lot of different disciplines. We have nowadays, we have, um, thanks to the European Space Agency and their Sentinel-1 mission, we have sensors in space that are free and open, provide data sets free and open, um, and observe the planet regularly and globally. So every six days to 12 days, depending on where you are, you have a guaranteed measurement um, uh, from space, uh, an image from space. And because radar is independent of weather conditions, um, it works during day and night, it is one of the very few instruments that is capable to do real 24-7 uh, monitoring of, of the ground. So we have now have communities that work on uh, hazard monitoring. We have, of course, the science communities for volcanoes, earthquakes, glaciers and ice caps, uh, the ecosystems that are all uh, clamoring to get their hands on these data sets. Why the evangelism is important is because radar has traditionally been uh, reasonably difficult to uh, deal with. Um, the data sets are literally complex, so they, they come in, in with amplitude and phase. Um, they come usually in data formats that are not familiar to people. And because they don't see, they see the world differently than we do with our eyes, they're not always as straightforward to understand right away. So we work heavily on um, educating or helping these new communities um, take advantage of this, the sensor type uh, by providing you know, new data sets, easier to use data sets, by doing a lot of outreach and training uh, to those communities that are coming along um, in the use of SAR. You used a verb I'm kind of curious about because I also made it in my notes a lot. It's what um, satellites see. Is that yes. technically right? Can you call it seeing or is seeing an, an organic thing that sort of corneas and retinas and, and cones and, and the brain does or is it just a simple way to describe how it senses things? 
Um, so for an optical system, it's maybe pretty close to um, to the visual cortex, uh, where you, you know, we when we look at the the world, we look at reflections. Sunlight comes in, we we get uh, you know scattering reflections, absor absorptions uh, by the environment, which gives the environment its color. In radar, it's slightly different. Uh, radar sensors are active, so they actually provide their own illumination source. So we transmit signals from a radar. It scatters off the ground and comes back to us or to the sensor. And then the sensor senses um, the responses. And so sensing is, is the more accurate term um, uh, than seeing, of course, from a, from a biological perspective. Do you, when you're talking to your, your peers and your fellow scientists, do you use it what it saw or do you say what it sensed? Um, I don't know. We, I think we use both. <laughs> uh, when we're more technical, we talk about sensing. And one of the things that um, you work with is the Alaska Satellite Facility, and we see the antenna here on the Fairbanks campus. There's a whole little antenna array up there on Westridge. So you're getting some of this synthetic aperture radar data pouring right in here to Fairbanks, and then you share that with the world. Yes, so if, if, you, if you guys out there haven't been to Fairbanks yet, or if you have, um, ASF uh, uh, hosts uh, one of the, the landmarks in Fairbanks, which is uh, a blue dish on the top of the Geophysical Institute. You can see that from essentially everywhere in Fairbanks. So if you come to Fairbanks this summer, you know, stop by, you know, just head for the dish and stop by. Uh, we always uh, will talk to you and, and give you a little tour. Um, so ASF is, is the NASA um, host for, for SAR data, the NASA so-called Distributed Active Archive Center for SAR data. It uh, hosts all of NASA-owned uh, SAR datasets. Currently, I'd say somewhere between eight and nine petabytes of data, a huge archive, all on spinning disks. So that um, was, for the, that's a petabyte that you said? And, yeah, it's about, it's, we, we're creeping in on 10 petabytes of data. That's a lot of um, data. Keep on going, thank you. Yeah, uh, so we data, everything dating back to 1978 uh, to today. Uh, current data sets are from the European Space Agency's Sentinel-1 mission. But we'll also be the host of an upcoming, exciting uh, NASA-owned uh, NASA ISRO um, uh, launched uh, SAR mission. So it's a collaboration between NASA and the European, uh, the um, Indian Space Agency. Uh, this sensor is going to call it NICE, will be called NISAR. Uh, it op operates at so-called L-band at longer wavelengths. It's really good for observing uh, deformation in natural environments, for observing ecosystems and glaciers and ice caps. It will be launched in 2021. It will produce an enormous amount of data globally over its lifespan. And ASF is gonna manage and host all of these data sets here in Fairbanks. That is, that that's an amazing collection of information that's gonna be coming in and really helping scientists all over the world uh, to sense our planet in a new way and, and to get, because the thing that you mentioned that one of the things about uh, SAR that I really love is it works at night when you can't see, but the computers and the machines can still sense. Yeah, so this is something why all the emergency response, all the hazard manage management communities, such like uh, FEMA and so on, are becoming more and more interested in this technology. Because if you think of you know hurricane hitting or you know rainstorms hitting and so on, first of all, they don't care about day and night. And also, you know, when you have hurricanes, um, you have heavy cloud cover, obviously. And also during rain events, you have heavy uh, cloud coverage. And SAR can penetrate these clouds as well and can provide measurements off the ground um, even during the ongoing event. Uh, so it's really useful for a lot of emergency response and, and hazard mitigation type of activities. Uh, and in terms of NISAR, I forgot my prop. I have oh, yes. Oh, there you are. Let's get, make sure that you That's the logo of NISAR. And so I hope you're all excited for NISAR coming up. We, we, we're going to get them excited. Uh, <laughs> So is the, one of the things I think we've, you and I have had a conversation before that talked a little bit about how the collaboration of UAF as um, sort of pioneers with unmanned aerial vehicles and installing some of this SAR technology into these drones and things like that, sort of bleeding edge technology of, of how you're doing remote sensing. Yeah, so, uh, the, so SARs in the past have been too big to really use uh, on, on, on UAVs, but there are um, mostly companies, commercial companies nowadays that build uh, radars that are small enough to put on, you know, medium-sized uh, uh, type UAVs, um, you know, UAVs that can carry 10, 15 pounds, maybe 20 pounds. Um, we've actually experimented with a company here before 
um, um, with a UAV capable instrument uh, was very exciting. So this is certainly a technology that comes along and could again make an impact when you are trying to sense at high resolution ongoing events. Um, say in Alaska, you have an, uh, a you know, volcanic eruption where you can't really fly with a manned aircraft close by because of security reasons. You might be able to use uh, UAVs uh, to do some of, the, some of the sensing during an ongoing event. Uh, so that's certainly one development that could be relevant for UAF. When you first started uh, your career um, as a as synthetic aperture radar sort of focused thing, do people, did your peers be like, oh, that's so charming. Oh, that's so cute. That's really not ever going to take off. And now it's like, ha you guys, who's in charge now? Yeah, so when, when I started, it was still a more esoteric thing to do. And, you know, for instance, my PhD, I did my PhD on something like 10 or 15 data sets. Um, you know, it, that was my entire PhD. Nowadays, you... Uh, you know, you have hundreds of images at your fingertips. Uh, we did uh, a class this spring here at UAF um, where we had people from all over the world uh, participate. And we did labs, you know, where we had like 150 images that we pulled in and did time series analysis on that. So these capabilities are really unheard of, at least in the world of SAR before, and are really exciting all the kinds of signals you see uh, uh, throughout the years, all the, in, in Alaska, all the freeze and thaw processes, all the landslide movements and all of these kinds of um, geodynamic uh, signals that you can sense and understand and map uh, um, is, is really exciting. It seems that this uh, field of study, the uh, synthetic aperture radar uh, sensing and, and analyzing the data is used for so many things, climate change research, crisis response, um, uh, planning of city planning, and you know all sorts of things like that. Are you surprised at how your data is used sometimes? Oh yeah, so we always get uh, applications that we didn't ever uh, think about. Um, we did some training in Africa um, last year, um, let's see, last year in January. And one of the applications they had was looking for um, really beetle infestations and um, uh, locust infestations, which you know was totally new to us. But the the effect on the ecosystem is so large when these um, when these pests come through that you can then map um, using these these satellite systems how the ecosystem is changing before and after such an infestation. Uh, so it, it has huge applications in things like. Um, food security, um, agriculture, and so on. Uh, so the, the applications are really growing all the time. And every time we teach, we get questions that we don't, you know, right away necessarily have an answer to because we, we hadn't really heard that kind of question or application before. So it's exciting. And that's the best way to learn yourself is to have people challenge you and to make you look at the stuff that you do every day in a new yeah. way. Yeah, especially now. I mean, we had a, we had a community that we worked with for a very long time already sort of the geophysics, geoscience community. Um, and, and that community, we understand, I would say, reasonably well. But now with the, the free and open data, the influx of, of new communities is, is tremendous. And sort of experiencing the kinds of um, hopes they have for SAR, experiencing uh, the, the, the issues they have and the questions they have is interesting every time. And, and uh, you always get faced with different kinds of uh, uh, issues whenever do trainings. And what's important, though, also for us is to not only tell people, um, you know, the, the things they can do with SAR, but also give them a little bit of a concept for the limitations um, of, of that technology uh, so that in the end, when they look at their set of tools that they have for observing a certain phenomenon, they, they pull the right raw, they take the right sensor. And, um, and so that kind of um, work is also very important uh, and, and something we learn as we go along what the limitations are. This is a pretty impressive thing to have here at the University of Alaska Fairbanks, this access to this <clears throat> and open data. Before I start talking about the, the wonders of UAF in general, uh, oh. I ask like who, it costs money to launch satellites, it costs money to build the technology to go in there, it costs money to collect this data, who pays for this free and open data? Yes, so, um, so, so currently most of these uh, instruments that uh, will become available, they are launched by the large uh, established uh, space agencies. Uh, so such as the European Space Agency uh, launched one um, a few years ago, the Sentinel-1 constellation. It was essentially funded by the European Union and the European Commission. 
Uh, NISAR's launch is going to be funded by the U.S. government. Um, so there's there's uh, governmental money that goes into these missions, but the benefit for the uh, for the people are are uh, tremendous. Uh, their contribution to you know day to day life of most people, you know whether it's um, in natural hazards and basically national security, if you want, uh, whether it's you know understanding when the next uh, volcano erupts or helping them to better understand uh, uh, these kinds of uh, events. Um, for some countries, it's important to understand their ecosystem biomass stock. Um, if you think of carbon trade and so on, uh, understanding your current state of the ecosystem and the development is very important for many nations. So it's um, there's a, a lot of benefits uh, for 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 a lot of uh, these nations that are launching launching these missions. Also nowadays, there's a lot of private companies that are trying to take these very expensive very sophisticated uh, systems and simplify them so that they can be launched uh, more economically. There's a few companies, there's one in the United States, there's one in uh, Finland, I think, that are launching these like um, small scale, small set, I wouldn't say CubeSat quite, but sort of 50 to 100 uh, kilograms um, um, radar, uh, radar satellites into space. And their plan is to launch fleets, uh, large, large constellation of those, so that you can observe the planet even more regularly, several times a day. Um, their data won't be free, but I think uh, it will be very useful um, for, for many, many applications where this kind of sampling is needed, many security-related applications. What a great example of how uh, government agencies and scientists want to help people every day, <clears throat> want to make life better for all of our neighbors and our friends. Yeah, what, another thing we've seen over the last few years is that uh, making these data sets available also spawns a lot of follow-up business. So there's a, a large number of uh, private companies that have spawned over the last uh, few years um, that take these original sensor data sets and turn them into a product that is more directly applicable, more directly useful to you know, whatever their customer base is. Um, so it has created a lot of jobs in follow-up industry um, um, by, by making the, the base data set uh, as broadly available as possible. Why do you stay at UAF? You could do this anywhere. Why keep your office here? <laughs> uh, I, like, um, I like UAF. I'm, I'm, um, I, I, I like the science uh, environment. I like it very much at UAF. Uh, UAF is a very um, um, communicative, very uh, strongly interdisciplinary um, organization. Um, everybody's always eager to work together on new projects. Um, I learn new things every day. I have this, I'm the chief scientist of the Alaska Satellite Facility, one of the you know, leading data centers for SAR data in the world. We are doing a lot of uh, cutting edge things in, in terms of uh, cloud processing, cloud storage, um, product development for SAR. I think it's, uh, it's a leading institution at UAF. Um, and, um, and so that, that's sort of fun um, to do and it's fun to work work on and I also like uh, the, the connection with students uh, I like working with my PhD master students, but I like teaching um, So overall, um, it's I think a, a pretty good job for me a pretty good position I like this work between the geosciences and engineering uh, The data center between the data centers and the applications communities. Uh, I think that's a, a good fit for me. And it is great. It's it's so wonderful to have you as part of the university uh, community. You're you're so outgoing. You share amazing, really helpful information online. If you're not following Sar Evangelist on Twitter, go and follow him uh, on Twitter. Always really great stuff. Dr. Meyer, thank you so much for taking some time to talk with me today. Um, in fact, uh, I'm going to say right now I'll be touching base with you every month as we get closer and closer to NYSAR, so we can get everybody sort of hyped up about it, and maybe we can follow you down there if you get to go to one two thousand by that. I think this could be the beginning of a beautiful friendship, as they say. <laughs> yeah, so NYSA is coming along. I think there's updates uh, regularly, so that should be exciting. That'll be great. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Thanks.